Based on what we saw in the last video, it may look as though the locomotive superiority hypothesis can be entirely discounted and that it's dead on its comparatively inferior feet. As we will learn in this video, there's been recent research that suggests we may need to revisit this hypothesis before we can truly lay it to bed. In 2012, Kubo and Kubo published a paper that compared how cursorial Triassic ornithodirans were relative to other archosaurs around at the time. Cursoriality refers to how well adapted for running an animal is, especially in regard to the length of its legs. In living mammals, we generally see a trend that those with longer legs in proportion to their overall body size run faster than those with shorter legs. A dramatic comparison of this would be how much faster a horse can run compared to a sausage dog. Even if you shrank that horse down to dog size, it would likely still outrun its canine competition. However, this correlation between long legs and speed doesn't always hold up. For example, both giraffes and flamingos have extremely long legs, but neither is exactly known for speed. Because of this, we can't say that just because an extinct animal has the long leg proportions that might mean it was a fast runner, it was, but it does make it more likely. More sophisticated modern methods, such as geometric morphometrics, which we'll introduce in our final video, can address these anatomical differences in greater detail and allow us to better figure out function. In the Kubo study, they tackled their research questions using methods rather similar to the traditional methods originally used to formulate the locomotive superiority hypothesis. Comparative anatomy was their main input data, and as I just discussed, was used as a proxy for function rather than biomechanically testing it. The relative length of the bones in the fore and hind limb were used as a morphological signal to determine two things about their study animals, which were more likely to be bipedal and which were more likely to be cursorial. This approach may have been traditional, but that doesn't mean it's not effective, and Kubo and Kubo were working with a much more current understanding of the methods and animals they were looking at than had been available before. Since the origination of the locomotive superiority hypothesis, there have been a great number of discoveries in this field. In general, our phylogenies, or family trees, of archosaurs are much clearer, and we no longer use outdated groups such as Thecodontia, which we discussed in video 2. This is due in part to a number of new discoveries of archosaurs. The discovery of Silosaurids, beaked close cousins of dinosaurs, or perhaps even early dinosaurs, and an improved understanding of the proto-dinosaurs called dinosauromorphs have added to our knowledge, and allowed us to fill in gaps in dinosaur evolution. And the discovery of bipedality in non-dinosauromorph groups such as the Poposaurs and Ephigia have made us reconsider the differences between Pseudosuchia and Ornithodira. These species hadn't been investigated in this context before, and so new information from studying them here led to more precise and accurate results, especially in conjunction with more refined methods of comparison, such as morphospace plots, which numerically test and visualise how different the anatomies of animals are. Kubo and Kubo came to the conclusion that in general, Ornithodirans plotted as being more cursorial than Pseudosuchia, and so this could have ultimately led to their success. However, they didn't stop there. In further work, Kubo and Kubo took into account data from footprints and trackways left by archosaurs in the late Triassic, and came to a similar conclusion, that dinosaurs were able to move faster than their Pseudosuchian cousins. Speed is reasonably easy to work out from trackways. We can take the distance between footprints and the approximate hip height of the animal that made them, and calculate from there. Although it does depend on accurately estimating hip height, this is still one of the most powerful techniques we have for figuring out the speed of extinct animals. A few years later, they also published work that considered the fact that dinosaur morphs were the only animals that exhibited tiptoed or non-plantigrade foot posture in the Mesozoic. There are a number of terms that can describe the way an animal stands on its feet, like plantigrade, digitigrade, and ungulagrade. Plantigrade means that it stands on the whole surface of the foot, with the heel touching the ground, flat-footed. This style of standing is seen in most archosaurs and humans, for example. Digitigrade refers to standing on just the toes. This foot posture is what is seen in dinosaurs, both extinct ones and living birds. Ungulagrade refers to animals that stand on hooves, effectively right on their tiptoes in the way that cows and horses do. Kubo's study found that an increase in body size throughout evolving lineages was present in non-plantigrade animals that evolved from a plantigrade ancestor, and no such relationship was seen in those that remained plantigrade throughout their lineage. This increase in body size was seen in non-flying dinosaurs in the Mesozoic in a dramatic way, with the cat-sized dinosaurs of the Triassic eventually changing to become the enormous sauropods of the Jurassic and Cretaceous, among a myriad of other huge forms. And this trend has been echoed in non-plantigrade mammals of the Cenozoic. 
This ability to grow and adapt afforded to dinosaurs by their foot anatomy could have helped them overcome environmental change. It certainly seemed to enable their gigantism. And the greater speed ability evidenced by longer legs and lengthy steps from fossil footprints matched the bipedal nature and tiptoed foot posture of many early dinosauromorphs. It all fit together. Dinosauromorph anatomy made them faster. This work has shone a light on the fact that perhaps a model of dinosaur diversification based on being superior to Pseudosuchians in some regard warrants further investigation. At the very least, luck may not have been the only thing the dinosaurs had going for them. Further and more detailed work is required to tease out what happened in the late Triassic that led to the incredible diversity of dinosaurs we see from the Jurassic onwards. Luckily, you're in the right place to learn about what comes next for the locomotive superiority hypothesis in the final video of the series. We hope you will join us, and if you want any more information about the locomotive superiority hypothesis or the Dawn Dinos project, then please visit our website, which will be linked below. We would also like to thank the European Research Council for funding this project. 